So hello and welcome to another consensus edition of Money Reimagined. We've done a couple more on Coindesk TV earlier this week on the ESG theme. This one, of course, is part of the conference's Central Bank Digital Currencies Exploration. Uh, I'm Michael Casey, as was just mentioned, Coindesk Chief Content Officer, and I'm joined, as always, by my Money Reimagined podcast co-host, Sheila Warren of the World Economic Forum. Hi, Sheila. Hey, Michael. And, and thank you for joining me at the ungodly hour, I know, of, of 7 a.m. Uh, <laughs> West Coast time. We've also got Benedict Nolans, I will mention in a moment, coming in from Hong Kong. So we are spanning the globe in terms of time zones here, uh, which is all part of the, the spirit of consensus and its global take on things. So, listen, as central bank digital currencies evolve from a loosely formed concept to a tangible real life projects ranging from China's DCP to the Bahamas sand dollar, a multiplicity of models has emerged. Some CBDCs take the form of direct to use a digital cash that's centrally managed and issued by a central bank. Others make commercial banks the issuers or agents of the central bank's digital money, while still others are leaving coin minting up to stablecoin providers. The event that blew all this open, I would argue, was the mid-2019 launch of what was then called Libra, whose original design was as a digital currency backed by a basket of fiat currencies. Founded by Facebook but managed by an association of member companies and NGOs, the project prompted a backlash from governments, which, which feared that this project would actually undermine their monetary autonomy. Libra took the board on board the criticism and now, having rebranded as DM, has pivoted toward a more CBDC-friendly structure. Wherever this new incarnation goes, though, one thing is clear. The Libra, the Libra slash DM project will forever be seen as having sparked the race for a digital fiat currency. Mm -hmm. The Libra announcement was a jolt and it spurred much of the innovation and experimentation that's now underway. So we're fortunate to have Christian Catalini, Chief Economist of the DM Association and a key contributor to its design as a guest today. Christian is on leave from his other role as a professor at MIT Sloan School, Management, School of Management, where he and I were both involved uh, in the MIT Digital Currency Initiative before I joined Coindesk. Uh, we're also extremely lucky to be joined by Benedict Nolans, the head of the Bank of International Settlements Innovation Hub in Hong Kong a perch from which she gets to view much of the frenetic activity going on in the CBD space. Welcome to you both. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Christian, why don't you take us on a journey? Take us from Libra to DM. So I want to know, like, what was the original thinking behind Libra's initial currency basket model? What is DM, its replacement? And why the shift now towards CBDCs? And one thing that's also interested me, why these names, right? Why, what, what does DM mean and why Libra? You're probably aware that lots of folks were speculating that, you know, Libra, Gemini, Zuckerberg, Winklevoss, you know, where, what is the thinking behind the name? And, and, and give us a journey from that transition, please. Thank you. Yeah, so I'll start from the last point. I mean, all of that is just speculation. The name uh, was was um, goes all the way back to when this was just uh, you know a Skunk Works project, uh, but the evolution of the name actually reflects a more um, you know intense journey, uh, which as you know involved uh, extensive engagement uh, with regulators across the globe. As I've said before, you know our first white paper was extremely naive and had a number of gaps in areas such as you know ML CFT. Uh, and, and also unaddressed questions on, you know, the perimeter of the network, unhosted wallets, and more. Uh, as part of that journey, uh, you, we, you know, we refreshed the white paper and we moved away from uh, the basket <coughs> to single currency stablecoins. The original design of the basket was really targeted at cross-border and remittances, uh, but a number of parties raised concerns about, at massive scale, uh, this threatening the sovereignty of uh, fiat-issued currencies. Uh, so the new design, again, uh, focuses on single currency stablecoins, starting with the DM dollar. And uh, as part of that journey, we're pretty much the, the only stablecoin project that I'm aware of that has publicly committed to phasing out a DM dollar and integrating directly with whatever public sector infrastructure becomes available um, in, in the next few years. Uh, so we see the focus of DM uh, straight into the, the payment system landscape and potentially in the future also financial applications on top of the network. It's meant to be an interoperable, low friction, high efficiency uh, payment infrastructure that can really complement the public sector journey uh, towards CBDCs. 
So Benedict, I'd love to hear from you as well. Could you talk us through that initial reaction central banks had to Libra uh, two years ago? And then, of course, as Christian noted, it's quite different uh, under DM. So what's the view now of central banks? Yeah, so it's hard for me to to speak about the initial reaction because I was actually uh, at at Circle, I think, when when Libra started its efforts, uh, and after that, I was uh, at Standard Chartered. Uh, but anyway, from from reading the the public information, I I think it was quite clear that the the focus was on the global nature of the stable coin, right? Uh, and, and as pointed out, the, the basket aspect of the stable coin. So these two things uh, did complicate uh, matters. Um, as, to, as to the current situation, I, I think um, it's, it's in a sense hard to generalize because the currently existing stable coins, most of them are actually US dollar coins, right? So most of them are, are US dollar underlier, even though they're not necessarily issued by, by US dollar uh, issuer, by US issuers, so to say. They're, they're non US issuers in the current stablecoin uh, landscape. So, uh, nevertheless, because the underlier is the dollar, I would think that the primary regulator to, to look at is, is in the United States for this purpose at, at this point of time. So, Christian, tell us. And of a course, bit about... that will change when there's when there's other underlying currencies. But right now, it's just the U.S. dollar. Yeah, uh, understood. And and Christian, I'd love to hear about that transition. And uh, the DM Association has a pretty large ecosystem around it. How was that perceived by that ecosystem? And how diverse is the ecosystem? Is it does it remain quite global despite that shift? Yes, absolutely. And you know, one of the things we learned from interacting with regulators is that. Uh, every single currency stablecoin that we will issue in the future will require some degree of localization in, in the local environment. And, and, and this, I think, builds on the comments that were just made. Um, to some extent, you know, that, that was something that we learned uh, in the process. That does not mean that you, know, you, you cannot use this network uh, to support cross-border payments or many of the use cases in the original design. Um, in, in a sense, you know, we, we're essentially moving to the United States, so that's kind of part of our strategic shift. Uh, to the United States and towards the issuance uh, of the DM dollar. Uh, and really reflects also the fact that, uh, you know, as, as the white paper has sparked a lot of debate and, and interactions, it's also true that the regulatory environment, even in the United States, has been evolving. Uh, for example, you know, you had the presidential working group document that, uh, you know, we've been using as, as a roadmap uh, in terms of like what kind of consumer protection elements we need to kind of build into the system, what kind of uh, financial crime, um, and anti-money laundering, you know, infrastructure that we need to put in place uh, to really uh, make this scale and become really useful to retail users in, in kind of day-to-day -day merchant transactions. So it, one of the appealing aspects uh, of the Libra uh, model, and uh, now DM presumably as well, Christian, was, you know, it's an open source system. You've got, you know, a wide, a broad membership, and you're inviting outside developers to build on top of it. Can you give us a bit of a picture of what that ecosystem looks like. The developers, how many, how many developers, how many independent apps? I suppose you could you could say, when is DMCon going to happen, right? Where's all that activity going at this stage? So we're, we're taking a phased approach to launch, and this is something that you know the regulators again express interest in in seeing uh, de-risking the system one step at a time. Uh, we, we're going to start with a small scale. Uh, pilot and then evolve out of that. Of course, there's a lot of interest by developers that want to build on the system. And, and in fact, you have wide documentation already available for the ones that are interested in. Uh, but again, we, we're going to take this one step at a time. And you'll see some of these use cases kind of come in progressively, uh, including you know domestic use cases, of course, with the DM dollar, but also cross-border one, uh, like remittance ones. Uh, so that, that's kind of our roadmap. Uh, and you know it will take us some time, I think, to have our own uh, developer event um, in, in in the future. Well, I expect some really good swag, Christian, when you have that event. <laughs> um, I'd love to ask each of you, and Benedict, we'll start with you. Uh, what do you see as the future landscape of all of this? So there's CBDCs, we've got stable coins, we've got cryptocurrency. Do you see these coexisting? Do you see the emergence of one of these as a dominant model? Uh, Benedict, over to you first. 
Yeah, I think it, I think that's the, the the question that everybody wants uh, the, the answer to, and I think we don't have the answer. But let's say from my personal opinion standpoint, and again, not necessarily that of the BIS, um, I think that uh, currently uh, already a situation of coexistence, right? So you do have the stable coins; they're operating different uh, regulatory systems. Uh, in the U.S., as I understand it, they're primarily operating under re remittance licenses, right? In in the states that that uh, permit the use of those remittance licenses, whereas in in other places in the world, they may come quite close to to what is called e money or SVF regimes for stored value facility regimes. So I think the, the regulation may, may still be quite different for, for stable coins, even let's say those where you don't have the global systemic uh, aspect to it. Um, they may be captured by currently different uh, regulatory regimes. And then the question is whether these regimes will evolve in, in some way or the other. I guess the second aspect is uh, to the extent that these stable coins evolve in that uh, regulation is whether they will have uh, access to central bank balance sheet or not, right? This is something that has been expressed quite a while ago, I remember by Mark Carney, right? So that's still uh, a decisive. So at the same time, you have this uh, central bank digital currency uh, development, and, and you do have our standing currency, and you do have the standing banking system. So um, to, to talk about standing currency, so let's say the banknotes and the coins, um, I think even in markets that are launching retail CBDC, it, it's unlikely that you will see these these banknotes and coins disappear in the near future because they do have a material financial inclusion aspect, actually. If, if you think about it, um, cash is one of the most inclusive uh, things that we currently have. And to turn that to digital cash, CBDC, doesn't necessarily mean that you eliminate the former, right? So on the digital current, on the, on the CBDC side, so the central bank digital currency side, right now, a lot of the experimentation can be distinguished between retail CBDCs and wholesale CBDCs. And I think it's a little bit hard to anticipate if these will converge in terms of the technology or not. Uh, but within the BIS Innovation Hub, we are running a series of these uh, prototypes. So we have a prototype around uh, retail CBDC, but in fact, most of our efforts right now are on wholesale CBDC. Uh, and the reason for that is because it's it's the wholesale payment cross border uh, that we think could go uh, a lot smoother. That is not to say that remittance shouldn't go smoother; it should go smoother as well. But that is said is a playground where where the private uh, players have been very concentrating, and and we don't need to mention the names, but there are a lot of parties in that space, right? A lot of private parties. So for the for the wholesale side, however, the very big payments across border, that's maybe where new uh, central bank infrastructure may be needed. Uh, it's, however, still to be decided how that central banking infrastructure will will look or, or which technology it will best run on. Um, and for example, the tests are currently all with DLT, but they're all enterprise uh, blockchains as opposed to public blockchains, for example. So if you ask me, I think we're already in a scenario where all of these are happening a little bit at the same time, right? So you have stable coins, then you have um, e-money regimes, then you have, uh, as I mentioned, retail CBDC, which is the Bahamas example and the, and the ECNY example, because that's primarily a retail CBDC. And then you have the wholesale CBDC efforts, uh, which actually concentrate within the BIS because we've gotten one in Hong Kong, one in Singapore, and one in Switzerland. And we actually currently only have these three centers. And then I said, don't forget that there still is the standing system, the account-based system that you have with your bank, as well as the coins and banknotes that you use every day. So I see this more as, as an evolving matter as opposed to... Um, I don't see this as a competitive matter at this stage. I see this more as seeing where everybody can best fit 
uh, to serve a need, right? And in, in technology, you always have to, to look for the use case, right? And that's the same for, for all parties that are part of this uh, evolution. So, so Benedict, I'm going to drill down a bit further into this um, because I think, you know, what you're talking about is this, is the question of interoperability. And, you know, that can be looked upon from a bilateral perspective or it can be looked upon from sort of this, you know, international almost standards-based concept. And I don't know how you, how collectively the world can actually drive the ladder when you've already got, you know, projects, cross-border projects that are emerging, for example, between the UAE and China and, 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 and other places as well. So, you know, what is the, from the BIS's perspective, like, what, it, it seems to me that, you know, ideally you'd want some sort of common standard to that capacity for different CBDCs, even at that wholesale level, to speak to each other. How do you get everybody to the table and not sort of trying to create their own runaround <laughs> solutions, or, or does it matter that, 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 that they're doing that? Yeah, I think uh, just to be clear as well, that the BIS uh, Innovation Hub is actually at this stage mostly focused on prototypes. So, and I think, you know, there's quite a big difference between a prototype and a production ready system, right? So um, on the prototype level, you're right. There are these different uh, different attempts ongoing, but they're, they're not at production uh, ready stage. And to get to production ready stage, they, they will actually need to decide exactly which is, is the best, uh, technology infrastructure for it. And secondly, also, which is the, as you say, the interoperability model are, are the standards. So everything you've raised is actually part and parcel of, of, of what, uh, let's say making these prototypes will, will prompt. And, and Christian, what role would the DM, uh, project play in this it's it's i think it seems as if you're seeing it as a transitional uh, payments facilitator for cbdc's do you see dm sitting in some way in the middle of of those cross border transactions and interoperability questions yeah maybe it's useful to take a little bit of a step back because i think today you know we we call a lot of things stable coins uh, but i do think it's a little bit of a misnomer uh you know you have algorithmic stable coins you have fiat back you have different degrees of transparency on, on fiat backed stable coins. You have different degrees of like capital requirements and buffers that are applied on top of stable coins that would matter a lot. For example, such a stable coin would perform in stress market conditions. And, and we're trying to do something slightly different. We're trying to set really higher standards in terms of quality and consumer protection. Um, and, and that also explains kind of the long term evolution and how we fit in the CBDC landscape. Uh, so DM again has committed to fading out, for example, DM dollar, if there were such a thing as a digital dollar issued by, by the Fed. And, and the intuition there is that, you know, if you're a payment network and you can enable through uh, smart contracts that in DM are called move modules, uh, all sort of additional applications on top of payments, then you see almost the different layers of the stack. The public sector, of course, has a, a large comparative advantage in developing anything that has to do with stability. Uh, money, value preservation, and, and macroprudential uh, policy. And we don't want to change that. And in fact, we want to build and, and, and take advantage of that infrastructure uh, to, to kind of accelerate use cases uh, for consumers, both domestically and also globally. So could DM be a connector between uh, different CBDC tokens uh, in cross-border transactions in the future? For sure. That's something that we want to support. But I think it's, it's, it's really important to stress that one of the reasons why uh, for example, we're able to fade out our own token is that our business model would not rely on interest on the reserve. Uh, most stable coins today rely on that quite heavily, but we don't really see a future where, again, our coin can ever compete with a coin issued uh, by the Fed. We see a future where we can add value in use cases to a coin issued by the Fed so that not only we can reach consumers and merchants and, and kind of retail use cases faster, uh, but we can also be a complement to the public sector. So. In this sense, we think about this much more like the early days of the internet, where you had like a backbone R&D and infrastructure that was developed by the pu uh, public sector. And then you had an explosion of commercial activities on top of it, which is kind of the internet as we know it. And it is really through that interplay between public and private uh, that I think we can deliver a stable coin that, you know, consumer can hold in their hands safely. They can kind of go and spend it uh, very much like in traditional payment systems, while at the same time getting extremely low fee, instant payments, and low friction, both domestically and, and cross-border. 
But do you want to just follow up a little bit? You talked about, you know, you, you wouldn't be looking at interest on reserves, just as the standard model for stable coins. Can you give us an inkling of what you see as the actual business model for, for DM then? Yeah, it's very simple. So it's a transactional based network. And our goal is to have extremely low transaction fees at scale. Uh, think about single digit basis points. So orders of magnitude cheaper than what you, what you have today. One advantage is that, as you all know, running a blockchain distributed system of, of this type is, is, is actually quite cheap at scale, given the choices that we've made. We, we don't rely, for example, on proof of work. Um, and, and so as a result of that, we can really innovate and reduce fragmentation uh, across a variety of payment systems today that either have legacy costs like interchange embedded in them or haven't really met the goal of being interoperable. We think of interoperability, going back to your point, Michael, as one of the most important features of this network. Interoperability will allow a small player, say a small wallet, to interoperate immediately with a larger wallet that drives competition, drives more consumer choice, not just on price, but also on dimensions such as privacy. So, you know, we, we think of that as a key ingredient of why this network can succeed uh, as a global payment system in the long run. So let's assume that we do get to a world where we've got fully interoperable, a fully interoperable payment system. We've got CBDCs, we've got stablecoin, and in some fashion, that is all functioning, you know, in a really highly efficient way. Uh, so what does that mean then for SWIFT? Does SWIFT just go away? Does it run in parallel? Uh, what also might it mean for U.S. dollar hegemony? Uh, you know, kind of the soft power implications here. Uh, I'm curious to hear, Benedict, why don't we go to you first? What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I, again, I think it's, uh, but again, we're just looking through the lens of what we're thinking or what, what, what we can see today. And maybe it's completely different in, in five years. But right now, except there is the distinction between retail CBDC and this wholesale CBDC, right? So um, I think what Christian is describing, I, I would put it more towards uh, the first, which is the, the retail CBDC uh, side of things, as opposed to the wholesale CBDC uh, side of things. And the reason this distinction is important from the perspective of your question, Sheila, is because uh, the SWIFT network is, is particularly focused on the wholesale uh, CBDC side in a sense that the, the remittance side is already handled through so many other apps, right, that, that are already, that have already in a sense taken up a large part of this space, apps and, and, and other methods uh, of payment. So I, I think it's it's a little bit too early to form views on on what happened happened to Swift. Another another reason why I find that too early to form a view on is because Swift is actually also evolving themselves. So, for example, one of the area I was looking into is 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 corporate digital identity, right? Because if you look from a financial inclusion point of view, one of the the big issues is that that if you can't onboard to corporates easily, if it's very complex to do the due diligence, which it is today, then you actually don't, you won't up your financial inclusion on that end, right? So, and as part of my research into that, I learned that SWIFT has continued these efforts actually of pooling information uh, across their members. Now, I still have to learn more about it, which I will do, but that's just to say that, that SWIFT is also uh, evolving uh, as we speak. So I think I see a lot of these claims about, you know, what would happen to, to Swift. I personally think it's it's too early to call that, even more so because of the first question you asked, which is, we don't even know at this stage whether the landscape will be that all these things will exist together in their own uh, regulatory uh, frameworks. Of course, let's say on the CBDC end, uh, as Christian also said, um, people do like government issued money, right? That's what they're used to. That's what's on the bill. That's what's on the coin. Um, and, and th th it might be so indeed that, that people, as, as, as all these methods are available, that they go for that. But that's too, even for me, it, for me, that's even too, too early to tell as well. Um, and I think you might have seen uh, John Conliffe's speech uh, about a week ago, which incorporated that recognition that a lot of people don't seem to realize that e-money is not government money. Right. They, they don't see the distinction actually between, between that, um, government back money or that e-money. In a sense, e-money has come around 
quite quickly, if you think in the history and the overall history, we're talking as quickly with many different offerings. So, so people just take comfort in the trust in, in the party that they're dealing with as opposed to, to necessarily one instrument over the other. And, and I think they, they very much choose an instrument based on their need. And that's what I said before with the need for the use case. They, they choose on their need. And for example, in, in remittance in Hong Kong, a very good test sector is always, is the Filipino uh, helpers because they need to send so much money back to the Philippines, right? And they're extremely fast adopters of different um, e-money systems, you could say, or remittance systems, anything to get that money easily to the Philippines and at low cost. And and I just said it, they only look for two things, easy and low cost. <laughs> That's what they look for, right? So, you know, so again, I, I think each of these instruments uh, will need to compete probably in that sense for easy and low cost. I do see the, the wholesale as slightly different, right? Because if you're moving a billion dollars, you most people want it to be moved safely. Now, I have to say not all people from what I can tell is going on sometimes in, in, in the crypto asset sector. But, you know, as a general matter, if you're going for big chunks like that, you want it to be handled safely. I, I, I would add to that, you know, on the... Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, maybe maybe I'll just briefly follow a few brief comments on that. Please. So I want to clarify that DM can really coexist and is designed to complement both a wholesale CBDC or a retail one. Uh, of course, we need to keep both designs in mind because different countries may go different ways. Um, if you think about our partnership with Silvergate Bank, which would be the exclusive issuer of the DM dollar, Fed regulated, uh, you know, Fed member bank, California uh, state chartered, um, the design, and especially when it comes to the reserve uh, being con you know, formed of 90, 92 days or less U.S. treasuries, it's very close to what you know, an eventual evolution to a CBDC may look like. Um, and, and that's why, you know, I, I think even existing networks, going back to, to the question about competition, when you actually have conversations with them, do see also the opportunity. Now, of course, we, we're going to bring uh, what I think is much needed competition into this space. Uh, but at the same time, it's also a cheaper, more efficient backbone that some of these other networks can rely on for new products and services. Uh, and last, on your point about the role of the U.S. dollar, uh, again, I want to go back to the early days of the Internet. And there were different choices, for example, that the United States made relative to other regions. Uh, and it turns out that the choices that the United States made uh, were what led to, I, I think, a number of, of really high impact uh, companies being founded here, uh, started as startups and, and grew into very large businesses. Uh, I, I think we need something similar in the United States, and, and it's going to have probably to take the form of a public-private partnership. You know, on one side, you hear people advocating for the public sector should do this completely alone. Uh, and we think that actually that, that's just going to be too slow and may lead to kind of over-engineering something that by the time it hits a consumer, it may not be really what, what they're looking for. On the other hand, you hear uh, people saying, okay, private, uh, private issued stable coins are enough. Uh, why worry about a CBDC? We disagree with that too. And that's why we're trying to really strike a hybrid where by working with the public sector and trying to really design strong protections and eventually phasing out our own coin, I, I think we can take the advantage of, of, of the best role for both types of entities, public and private, very much like in the early days of the internet. So I wanna ask you, Christiane, about Benedict's point about trust. And if she said that, uh, well, I, th I really appreciated John's comments last week about uh, e-money and people not really necessarily pushing back and realizing or kind of doing the investigation to realize that's not actually government backed money. Um, you've certainly had to wrestle with trust around certainly the Libra days and, and possibly even now with DM. Do you think that's right? Do you think that people are really, in your analysis, if you found that to be the case, people just don't really care about things as long as they're easy and they're cheap? They don't really care about who's behind it or who's the issuer or any of that? I think over time they will, right? And, and one of the things that, for example, uh, an ecosystem like DM improves on is that when you think about e-money, or even uh, MSB regimes in the United States, the quality of the backing uh, of what looks like a digital dollar balance in your digital wallet uh, varies across, you know, across states, across um, jurisdictions. And so what we're trying to do by designing kind of the reserve 
is ensuring that every wallet coming onto the DM network all benefit from those design choices. Uh, those are choices that, as you can imagine, are the result of intense conversations uh, with entities like, like the Fed and others. And we want to really be the gold standard for consumer protection, financial disclosures by participants, for example, and really ensure that you know, when a consumer uses the network, it, it's as safe as it, as it can ever be. Um, what, one example is that you know, uh, stablecoins today have an all sorts of leverage applications on top of them. I, I think everything happening in DeFi is extremely exciting. There's a lot of innovation in that space. But at the same time, when you tag on DeFi on top of a stablecoin, what, what you're essentially doing is reintroducing leverage into a system that is meant to be kind of one-to-one backed. And, and that's something that we don't want on the DM ecosystem. So, you know, vast virtual asset service providers like wallet and exchanges will not be able to fractionalize their coin holdings. So they, they cannot turn into shadow banks. We think that's really important for, for kind of protecting the perimeter and giving a good customer experience. Uh, but to really answer your question on trust, uh, this is a project that, of course, uh, started probably on the wrong foot with, with a white paper that was much more of a crypto white paper uh, than what probably the regulators expected has evolved and matured. And honestly, I think we'll have to build trust once we go live over time. Um, and by really bringing in high quality wallets and, and providers and exchanges and, and providing a really good customer and merchant experience, I think over time, that, that's where we will be able to, to build trust. So Christian, uh, you know, I'm, I'm glad you raised earlier uh, this point about the internet model, because we talk about it a lot on Money Reimagined, the podcast, and how you know, the, whatever this future looks like, wherever it's going, uh, the system that should win, at least if we look at the internet history as, as guide here, would be one that is open, that allows for um, as much innovation as possible. And that was, I think, in some respects, the victory that the US won in its approach to the internet in the 90s. And we think that this is probably the best way to go about it in the future of money. <laughs> but you were describing limits right there. You were talking about, you know, you don't want to have uh, players that could fractionalize their reserves and, and, and introducing leverage. And there's a very good reasons for all of that. But how do you get the balance? Because clearly it's this explosion of innovation that is hopefully the way that, that, that leads us to a better system. Yes. And, and, and look, that, that balance is a very difficult one to strike over time. Of course, we're trending very conservative uh, as we open up. And then over time, of course, as we learn more on, on what can be brought onto the network safely, I think we'll work with engineering teams and with uh, policy teams, of course, to, to expand that. Um, but one of the things we learned was that, you know, uh, objectives like combating financial crime, ensuring financial stability, ensuring that, you know, this is not a coin that accelerates dollarization in emerging economies or destabilize local currencies by supporting capital flight. These are super important goals when you're dealing with payments and financially regulated activities. And so what we're trying to do is, is kind of blend the two so that we bring in the, the protection that people have come to expect from the existing system, while at the same time keeping it as open, interoperable, internet protocol-like. Uh, it's going to be a journey. And you know, when you think about an issue, for example, like unhosted wallets, we're not going to have unhosted wallets when, when we launch. Uh, we, we do think that, you know, especially if you look at the presidential working group, it's very difficult for us to meet the requirements of unhosted wallets and, and still provide a safe um, you know, experience. Uh, over time, I think through better identity standards, working on last mile frictions and ensuring that you, know, you can distinguish between a honest user that's coming from uh, a region maybe where KYC used to be weaker. If we can lift those standards, I think then we can bring all these features back in. It's just going to take a little bit longer. And you know, part, of, part, part of our lesson was that we're trying to jump to the end state and it's going to take a series of moves to evolve the network into that. Uh, but I can assure you that the openness of the network and really ensuring that people can build on this um, in, in, in a very open cryptocurrency spirit, it's something that, you know, drives a lot of the vision of the project. It's just, you know, it, it's, it's now phased over, over multiple stages. So, uh, Benedict, I mean, this is, and, and you've, you've made some points as you've been discussing this about how we don't really know what the future looks like. In some respects, that open innovation scenario is precisely that. It's unpredictable. Um, however, there's reasons why uh, central banks all around the world are exploring this. And I think this takes us from this higher level, you know, macro global conversation we've just been having down to the domestic level. Like, 
And the question I have is why? What are the actual use cases? What are the actual benefits that you see as the drivers as to why central banks are embracing this as something that they see as beneficial to them and hopefully, of course, to their citizens? Okay, so I just want to clarify one point uh, before because I wasn't sure if 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 Sheila had misunderstood it. I said trust comes first, and after that it is ease of use and and speed and cost. You see, I I didn't say trust yeah, is not important. It, it yeah yeah. So trust mm -hmm. is the most important, and 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 as I mentioned, for government issued money that that is naturally existent with people through history. For e money, that is not necessarily necessarily uh, nat naturally existent and it depends in some on many factors including you know internet readings how many people are using it etc i don't need to go into too much uh, too much detail about that so uh, michael um just to to go back uh to your question what's in it right what's in it so um I, I think, uh, let's say the debate that all of this evolution has thrown open and rightfully so is that cross border payment is expensive and slow. So it's the opposite of, of cheap and fast, right? It's expensive and slow. So, um, Let's say some of the wholesale CBDC efforts, including the one you're referring to, uh, called Internet Lion Rock and now called MCBDC Bridge, is, is looking at reducing that cost and making it more speedy. But again, to achieve that is not easy. And, and we've put a lot of information on our website. If you want to take a look on the BIS uh, Innovation Hub website on, on this topic. So for wholesale CBDC, it's cross-border targeted, it's targeted at reducing cost, and it's targeted at increasing speed, right? So that's very clear. Now, for retail CBDC, the domestic use cases, and that includes both uh, Bahamas and China at this stage, there's actually uh, the, the common element is financial inclusion. So for China, for example, the ECNY, um, can be people can use the or, or open a wallet by simply having their phone number right so they don't need a bank account that already opens the financial inclusion now of course the wallet is then i i suppose is going to be there's not too much detail on this but i'm pretty sure there will be uh, restrictions on transaction size and wallet size but it allows for, for this kind of uh, opening of the wallet with a phone number to achieve financial inclusion. It also has a lot of technology features that allow for inclusion of, of even disabled, disabled people and, and things like that. The same in the Bahamas, the financial inclusion agenda was, was very big. Now, that doesn't exist necessarily in a developed market. So a developed market may need to look for, for other levers. Now, in China, there was also a secondary or uh, primary motivation around the concern that uh, the system was too dependent on, on a limited number of players and that that posed systemic risk. Uh, again, I'm not speaking on behalf of the regulator. I'm just reading like anybody else what's quite clear in the newspaper, right? So. So I think these are the, the motivations there for, for retail CBDC. But I can see um, the motivations exist also in developed markets, but they may be different. They, for example, as well, one thing we didn't talk about is, is the programmability of money, right? So for any kind of targeted payments like COVID payments, uh, you could make them much more targeted. And interestingly, again, the ECNY can be programmed. It has programmability um, pilots ongoing that you can only spend it on certain purposes, for example. So if different countries uh, want to go down the path of, of different exploring with these different things, they'll need to choose what am I after, <laughs> right? right? Am I right. after financial inclusion? Am I after an, an financial infrastructure I issue? Am I after um, I and I just like yeah. to bring it to Christiane just because we have to close up very quickly here because I think it's a relevant one, right? Obviously, one of the criticisms that was applied to the Libra project, and I'm not sure that it was actually valid, but nonetheless, it was a legitimate one, was that, you know, Facebook has this had this power, this data gathering capacity, and therefore it brings us to this question of privacy. And the trade one of the trade-offs we're talking about, and Benedict's mentioning it here, is like, you know, do you want this or that? Programmability, the flip side of that is in some respects the, the power of the state 
to actually manage directly your money and therefore, therefore to transact it. What do you see as important? How do we make sure that we find this balance where human beings are not entirely surveilled the whole time through this? Yeah, I think you know, so, lo looking back at the... Oh, Michael, let me know Christian, if, yeah. if you meant... Thank you, Christian. Okay, Thank you. perfect. Yes. Uh, so I think looking at, at privacy, right? So this is a technology that is innovating on the privacy landscape uh, when it comes about selective disclosure and what you can really do with it. Uh, so I think we just need to deploy it in the right way. Uh, DM, for example, is going to be privacy by design, and we also want to encourage privacy as a dimension of competition on the network. When it comes to the CBDCs, I think it's going to be a really important uh, public discourse element to get privacy right. Uh, there's there's clear trade-offs, right? On one side, of course, you want to ensure that you can fight financial crime, uh, but that still needs to follow kind of the, the proper process. Uh, and so I think we, my my personal hope is that we will land on designs that protect you know, civil liberties and, and all those important dimensions while also giving us the benefit of potentially a digital version of the US dollar. Fantastic. All right, Christian, thank you for touching on that. That's a topic, of course, that we could have gone into a lot more detail about. It's a rich one and one that's of, of great importance to the people here at Consensus. That's all we have time for for those. So thank you both to Christian Catalini, Benedict Nolans. Uh, it's, been a, it's been a pleasure. Thank you, Sheila, my co-host of Money Reimagined. Uh, I do want to do a little bit of a plug for Money, Re Money Reimagined. We are a weekly podcast. We land an audio version on uh, on Fridays, and then it comes out as a video on Twindish TV on Saturdays. Please make sure you subscribe to it. You can get it, you know, wherever you find uh, you, you get your podcast from, or of course directly on Coindesk.com. But it's been a pleasure uh, for all of you to, to join us here today. So much more programming still to come on Consensus. Stick with it. Um, over to you, Aaron and Nick. Great. Thank you so much, Michael and Sheila Benedict.